Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. The 2017 wheat harvest is underway. Combines have been rolling in southern Oklahoma and are just starting to get some momentum a little farther north. Producers, of course, are keeping a close eye on the forecast. Meantime, we're returning to the recent wheat field day at Lahoma to talk about insects and winter crops. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our extension entomologist, Tom Royer. Every year in Wheat Canola, there are always insects, and Tom, it seems like every time we're talking to you, it's because we're kind of reactionary towards the insects, mm -hmm. but just kind of give us an overview of, of, of what insects there are that, that, that could cause a problem with wheat. Well, that, that's what I was talking with the growers. Um, for one thing, we talked about managing hessian fly, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my goals this year was to uh, start talking about trying to find answers to questions that I didn't have answers to before mm -hmm. by getting some data. So I, I talked about some hessian fly trapping that we've done over the last few years to actually prove that hessian fly free date, planting dates don't work in Oklahoma. Right. We now know why they don't work. Yep. Um, but uh, we talked about fall armyworm this year and why it came in so early and, and how important it is to catch them early if you're going to be able to get good control because uh, they become a lot more difficult when they get bigger mm -hmm. um, and why we had such an issue with them this year. Um, talked about diamondback moth and why we had such issues with that this year and uh, there were definitely producers that had difficulty controlling it. Um, and in one of the cases, I was able to show that a uh, more expensive product would have sufficed to give one shot and they'd have controlled it probably for the next 20 to 25 days. So, um, so we just kind of reviewed different insects. I uh, got a question about the uh, wheat streak mosaic and the mite that causes that and can you control that? And I do know from the data that we don't have anything that can control it. So we're going to have to be looking for resistant varieties and things like that, or, you know, encouraging people to manage their volunteer wheat uh, for at least two weeks, those kind of issues, which is good integrated pest management, right? So uh, we just reviewed just different things that could happen in wheat and, and what to do about them. Well, and, and, and it's, it's important to gather that information ahead of time before you're actually in the, in the right. trenches with them. Yeah, I, I heard Kim Anderson talk about uh, strategies and plan. The strategy yeah. is a series of plans that you put together and that's really uh, I think what producers need to think about with insect management, with weed management, obviously with everything that they're doing, mm -hmm. but, but it can work for insect management as well as you come up with a, a strategy uh, and it's based upon what could possibly happen and how to deal with it. Now let's also talk about canola because I mean we, we, we focused on wheat there but there's yes. also some some insect issues and, and you mentioned a few of them in the canola. Yes, uh, two big issues that we had this year were aphids. We still are even getting some issues with aphids but uh, and then diamondback moth. I saw fields this year I haven't seen uh, populations of diamondback moths like I never seen them in canola like I saw them this year. And they were, um, you know, the, the producer that I worked with was very frustrated because he couldn't get any control over them. And that's when uh, I, it gave me an opportunity to really evaluate another uh, insecticide, Prevathon, that uh, is supposed to work pretty well. And, and I was able to show that it worked really well on them. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And for more information on that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Our extension weed specialist, Misha Manucheri, is also at Lahoma. And Misha, you're talking with growers today about new herbicide technologies. Yes. Yep, we're talking about some new herbicide technologies that we can use to primarily control our tough winter annual grasses and wheat, but also some of our broadleaf weeds as well. Um, and the main products we're talking about, um, and these aren't the newest, they've been around for a couple of years on the pre-emergent side, uh, looking at different products that have the active ingredient pyroxysulfone in them. Um, Zidua and Anthem Flex are the two products and 
We're having a lot of success with growers putting these products down, delayed pre-emergence to control Italian ryegrass. And that's been a big issue over the years, right? Talk, talk about that a little bit and how these work specifically. Sure. So our weeds are very adaptive and typically our weeds that are the most problematic are our weeds that mimic our crop. So in a winter annual crop like wheat, our winter annual grass weeds are our issue. Um, some of our post-emergence products we don't have as maybe as much success um, as we have had in the past. That could be due to resistance issues. Sometimes it's just hard to get a timely post-emergence product out. And so we are encouraging growers who have those post uh, challenges to look at the pre-emergence timing and how a pre-emergence herbicide kills a plant is you apply it uh, after planting and it inhibits um, basically that weed to germinate. And so we're seeing success that shortly after wheat comes up and then Italian ryegrass wants to come up, when we have that herbicide down, we have seedling inhibition. Terrific. What other kind of questions are you getting from growers out here? We're getting some questions about um, rescue grass control. Uh, what can I do during my fallow period? That's a big question. And Dr. Todd Bauman, uh, who's our row crop weed scientist in Ardmore, him and I are working together to find out what can we put down uh, after harvest until we plant that next crop or we don't have to go out in the field and make five passes of a herbicide. Um, so hopefully we'll have some answers um, on those questions soon. Are you setting up some, some research to, to look at that? Yes, we'll be uh, setting up some rescue grass trials this fall. Um, as well as in this fallow period, we'll be putting some products out this season. So uh, try to get as much out as we could my first season, but still have a lot of questions we want to try and answer. Terrific. Well, keep us posted. Okay. We appreciate your time Thank today. Thank you. Farmers are squeezing wheat harvest and hay baling in between storm events. The moisture is unwanted for wheat and hay harvest, but the rain means better soil moisture for summer crops. Farming has always been one of life's ultimate balancing acts. With bands of rain crossing the state every four to five days, it's hard to imagine any spot in Oklahoma has been dry. A map of soil moisture at four inches through Tuesday showed some areas that have little soil moisture for young summer crops. Hollis and Altus in the southwest were dry at four inches, but so were Cheyenne, Hobart, Ninica, Oklahoma City North, Stillwater, Pawnee, and Blackwell Mesonet sites. Dropping down to the 10-inch depth, soil moisture levels were on the low side at Hollis, Cheyenne, Oklahoma City North, and Blackwell. Soil moisture conditions were better at the 24-inch depth. Ardmore had the lowest fractional water index, 4 tenths. Eric, Cheyenne, and Blackwell had readings of 5 tenths on a scale where 0 is bone dry and 1 saturated. While fractional water index values are point measurements, plant available water tells us how much water is available in a column of soil. From the surface down to 16 inches, the brown areas don't have much water available for plants. Yellow areas are on the marginal side. Maybe early June rains will fill in those soil moisture gaps. Farmers have also been checking soil temperatures. Soils were warm in a band from Warica to Cheyenne across southwest Oklahoma, up through central Oklahoma, and up into north central areas. The three-day average bare soil temperature at four inches was 80 degrees or higher at 26 of the Mesonet's 121 sites. Four locations had four-inch soil temperature averages of 82 degrees, Oklahoma City East, Medicine Park, Tipton, and Granfield. Those warm soil temperatures will help newly planted summer crops of cotton, peanuts, and okra spring out of the starting gate for a vigorous early game. All our wet rainy weather contributes to more plant diseases. Pecan scab concerns have been on the increase. Even native and low susceptibility pecan trees, those in the red map areas were getting close to their disease threshold of 30 pecan scab hours on Wednesday evening. 
Pecan trees in the light green areas were seeing their disease hours climb as well. A number of sites had pecan scab hours in the mid-teens on Wednesday evening. And the wet weather that ended this week will lead to more pecan scab hours. Peanut leaf spot infection was also a concern. The control threshold for peanut leaf spot is 36 hours over the last two weeks. Fields in the green and blue areas were below the 36-hour threshold on Wednesday evening. Peanuts that haven't had a fungicide application in the yellow, tan, and red areas were at high disease risk Wednesday evening. Hopefully our latest round of wet weather was just what you needed and not too much. Thanks for watching this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. So many times we hear about implants in cattle and, and Dave, kind of walk us through what is an, an implant? They're uh, naturally occurring and synthetic versions of steroid drugs that were approved by the Food and Drug Administration actually starting back in the 1950s and they've been approved ever since. Uh, the three that you that are used in cattle for implants are estrogen, testosterone, and progesterone and their synthetic versions. What does that mean for for the, 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 the beef producer that's, that's kind of thinking about it and they're thinking well it, it, it's a little more money that I have to put into the to the animal and they you know so if we if we restrict our conversation to that implant that's delivered at branding time mm -hmm. you know those are going to cost around a dollar 25 to a dollar 50. you also have to have someone there that's comfortable administering the implant and it's interesting that use of that technology has declined substantially one reason is probably the the administration of them mm -hmm. uh, you know people that aren't experienced with animal health uh, procedures mm -hmm may be uncomfortable doing that. The other reason that it's declined in use is more than likely has something to do with of not uh, wanting to put that in, in a food product just, just from a public perception standpoint. So what is the impact as it, as it does enter the cow? So the FDA has to study that um, rigorously mm -hmm. and, and they, these products only get approved after they have been through a, a series of experiments to determine the impact on residue in meat. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, recognize that they're, they're naturally occurring hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and their synthetic versions. Mm -hmm. For perspective, the estrogenic activity in non-implanted beef uh, off the shelf is somewhere around eight nanograms per about one pound of meat product, mm -hmm. about eight nanograms. On the other hand, if you were to sample a beef product off the shelf that had come from an implanted calf, now this would be an animal that was implanted through the finishing phase. Right. So it would have substantially more impact on residue than, than just an implant at branding time. Nevertheless, that value is about 11 nanograms per pound of meat product. Uh, milk has 65 nanograms per pound. Um, ice cream, about 3,000. Let's see, so eggs, 17,500. And soybean oil, 1 million nanograms of estrogenic activity per pound. Okay, thank you much, Dave. And for more information on that, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Daryl Peel, our Livestock Marketing Specialist, is here now. And Daryl, with Memorial Day passed, let's talk about beef demand and kind of what it looks like for the rest of the summer. Well, you know, we've come into Memorial Day with very strong uh, apparent beef demand. It's supported markets well through, uh, you know, through the first quarter and, and so far in the second quarter of the year. We still have a lot of summer demand ahead of us. Uh, Father's Day is coming up, uh, followed uh, quickly with uh, Fourth of July. So uh, we're, at this point, we anticipate good demand. We're still kind of waiting for the final assessment on Memorial Day, but in general, it looks like we're in very good shape right now. 
Let's talk about the latest cattle on feed report and the, the large placements for April and, and, and what that means moving forward. The, you know, the placements in, in the month of April were bigger than expected uh, and the market reacted a little bit to that. It's, it's in general not a surprise. I mean, we know there's more cattle out there. There's more cattle going to come through the system. And, and you have to be a little careful with one month's number. Sometimes these things is a matter of timing. I think there were some larger placements in April in part because, uh, uh, you know, cattle that were out on wheat pasture, for example, in the southern plains, many of them came off in April either because the cattle got too big or because the producers wanted to convert to a summer crop. So they wanted to get those cattle off of the wheat so they could prepare the ground for a summer crop. So I think it's a timing issue. Some of the cattle that would have come in May probably came in April, even though there are still some graze out cattle out there that will come in May as well. In terms of beef production, is it about what you would expect for, for this year? Beef production is, is up for the year as expected. Uh, it was up stronger than expected a bit in the first quarter of the year. Uh, but in the last five or six weeks, it's, it's down to where it's only up about one and a half percent on a year over year basis. Uh, carcass weights have been uh, lower than expected and that's holding the increase in beef production in check. When it's all said and done as we go through the year, I think we'll probably end up pretty close to what we expected. Uh, we're looking at a roughly 4% year over year increase on an annual basis in beef production this year. Profit margins uh, are, are pretty good, but that's a little unusual. Can you explain that and give us some perspective? You know, the beef industry is quite complex with all the different sectors, and it's not common typically for all of them to be making money at the same time. And yet that's kind of what we see right now. Uh, and, and it really go, it goes back to that demand issue. That when demand is good, uh, we're kind of moving up. It's easy for everybody to be uh, sort of operating positively in, in that kind of an environment. So I think that's what it really speaks to. Uh, packer margins have been pretty good. Feedlot margins are good. Uh, and in general, there's, there's profitability all the way down the sector, uh, you know, down to the cow-calf level. So as long as this lasts and, and uh, you know, we do have bigger supplies, but as long as the demand is there, uh, it's going to be a good time. And in general, it's, it's very favorable for the entire industry right now. And I'm sure investors are, are pretty happy as a result. You bet. Daryl, thanks a lot. We'll see you again soon. Lameness is a, a particular issue for cattle producers anytime, anywhere. Certainly in the summertime, we worry a little bit about lameness due to such things as foot rot. But the kind of lameness that I want to make sure today that producers are aware of is a situation, a defect, that we call corkscrew claw, or some producers just, just call it screw claw. And this is where, as you see in this particular photograph, where the toes actually would grow inward rather than straight forward. Screw claw more likely is to occur in the hind legs than it is in the forelimbs, but has been seen sometimes on front feet as well. It's most likely to show up in cattle that are two to three years of age or older. And that, that makes it therefore difficult to uh, select young livestock, young bulls, young heifers, and try to select away from that particular trait because it shows up later in life. It causes problems because as they walk, then that outside toe forces the weight to be pushed to the outside and causes uh, soreness in the joints, uh, perhaps some arthritis as well. And the cattle then, uh, as we've talked about, all will show real signs of lameness. Certainly, if you see this in uh, an animal in your herd, first of all, I would contact my veterinarian and have them look to make sure that that is, in fact, what we're working with, rather than just a situation of laminitis or founder, because it makes a real difference as to whether you're going to cull that particular individual cow or bull or just trim their feet and uh, see if they don't recover. Screw claw, it's, uh, there's some debate about the heritability of that particular trait. We don't know for sure how highly heritable it is, but there's certainly indications in uh, dairy information that says that there's a higher incidence in one breed than others. Veterinarians that work with large herds tend to think that uh, screw claw shows up in certain families of beef cattle more so than in other situations. 
Therefore, I think that if we uh, want to identify, if we find a particular animal that's either a, a reproducing bull or uh, one of our adult cows that we're sure has screw claw and our veterinarian confirms that, I would go ahead and call that animal and not select especially daughters from that individual in order to try to get that genetics out of my herd. I thought it'd be helpful if you had a better understanding of this particular lameness defect and can give yourself a chance to work out of any situation to where we don't have more of this showing up in our beef herd in the future. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. It's that time of year again. Combines are rolling across Oklahoma, and Kim, you've been talking to elevators. What are you hearing from them? Well, I think yields are coming in probably around expectations, maybe slightly below that down south because of the weather. A uh, test weight is very good, 60 plus uh, pound test weights. The protein, I think, is uh, disappointing. Other uh, reports, 10 and a half to maybe 11 percent protein. Okay, now how's the wheat prices look? Well, right now prices have increased a dime to uh, 15 cents over the last week. We've had a 10 to 15 cent increase in the basis. The futures are just kind of wallowing around si sideways. Cash prices in, in Oklahoma is running somewhere between 350 and 370 a bushel. Should producers go ahead and sell right now or should they store a little bit? Well, if they're looking at a strategy, uh, they can sell right now for the current price or you, you can store it into the fall. Right now, the market is, is offering around uh, 49 50 cents to store wheat between now and November. That's just looking at the spread between the July and the December contract. Uh, this time last year, uh, if you look at uh, a strategy, elevators bought wheat, if they had hedged it, put in a storage hedge on July 1 and taken it out uh, last day of April, they'd have made a dollar and a nickel a bushel on that on that hedge. So right now the market is, is telling them to store wheat. There's always the third and the third and third strategy. If you have on farm storage, you may want to look at that storage hedge because the market's telling you right now they want it in that December, January time period rather than now. Let's talk about wheat and carry right now. Well, like I said, on that carry, uh, elevators and I think, you know, our, our, our protein is down and you expect our basis to, to go down, to, to our price to decline because of that. But the elevators want to buy that uh, wheat now. They want it in storage because the market's offering them about 80 cents carry between now and next June. Uh, this, you know, this time last year it was offering them about 66 cents. So the market's offering the elevators a pretty good premium to buy the wheat and store it so because it doesn't need it right now. If you're a producer and you got on farm storage you may want to consider that it's not a guarantee but right now that's that's that that looks like a pretty good situation mark is telling you to hold the wheat even with 2016 wheat still in the bin even with 2016 wheat in, in the bin this week uh, we got low, lowered production in russia we got lowered production in france we got lowered production in spain the market's moving in the right direction and if we can get you know some of these foreign crops less production we're going to have a higher price in the fall okay thank you much kim anderson grain marketing specialist here at oklahoma state university We're talking about vegetable oils today with Nurhan Dunford, our oil and oilseed chemist here at the Food Nag Products Center. And Nurhan, I guess the big question is what vegetables actually go into vegetable oil? Actually, uh, any oil that is extracted or recovered from a plant can be called or labeled as, as vegetable oils. In general, uh, uh, vegetable uh, or plant seeds are used uh, to extract oils. Most common uh, oils uh, used for cooking are uh, soybeans, uh, canola seeds, sunflower seeds, peanuts, and uh, safflower. So is there a way to find out exactly what's in there and kind of be able to compare and, and choose depending on what you're cooking? Uh, depending on the product, I think the easiest way to find out what is in the, in the oil or in the product is to look at the, uh, the label of the product. I have an uh, example here. This oil says on the label, it says canola oil because there's only one type of oil uh, in the product. But sometimes uh, that's not the case. Uh, industry mixes different types of uh, oils 
In that case, label might say vegetable oils in, without referring to the, the plant source. Uh, in this case, for, uh, for example, it says pure vegetable oil, but it doesn't indicate which plant it comes from. To find that out, the easiest way would be to look at the ingredient list. Let's talk about blended and why they're blended at times and kind of what all that means. There are several reasons for uh, blending oils. The first reason is uh, the, to improve the functionality. As we know, uh, different vegetable oils have different properties such as uh, fatty acid composition saturated fat, uh, fat content or unsaturated fat content, smoke point or the flavor. So the uh, industry uh, mixes some of the or blends some different types of oils to get a, a formulation or a mixture that would suit or the, uh, work best for the specific uh, uh, application. In that case, on the label, it might say blend blend or it might say vegetable oil so bottom line do your homework and look at the back of the label if you need read to the, read the ingredients list and the labels always mm -hmm. a good idea thanks for your time today great Thank information you. keep track of how harvest is progressing, we like to check out the Oklahoma Wheat Commission reports on their website every couple of days. They do a good job of keeping track of what's going on all around the state. And we have a link for you on our website. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Lyndall Stout and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.